Welcome to the uh, Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sorelli. I'm joined by Yuri Barich uh, of the Highlander, uh, who has a very interesting story and has created a adventure race concept that really reconnects people not only with themselves in nature through mentally and physically uh, challenging uh, events, which which I love. When you remove the competition, uh, it makes it mental, it makes it spiritual. Uh, and that's what we're all all about here at the Everyday Warrior. But Yuri, you've got one hell of a story, man. Um, born in Croatia, correct? Yes. Yeah, so I was born just in the middle of war in Croatia. It was the uh, beginning of 90s. And we had like a very hard time over there because, you know, Serbia and uh, Croatia were in the war. And, you know, sleeping in the basements um waking up with uh, shelling and uh, sirens, and it was very, very tough. And a friend of mine, they, they start to organize um, some kind of gathering for people who ride BMX, inline, skateboard, and they used to gather before the war. So, so they just started to doing it again, and I fall in love with that because it was kind of positive energy, no competing, it was very cool, and this is how I finished in BMX. And after a few years, I found that I really love extreme sports and I started doing it for real. Uh, when I say for real, I, I was doing it like, uh, let's do it. Maybe I can compete. Uh, maybe I can do some uh, prize money. Maybe I can fight <laughs> for life through BMX. And this is how I finished in the BMX. Yeah. And uh, then I, I, I was already a pro athlete a few years after and I got a Red Bull sponsorship, became Red Bull athlete started traveling around the world because for me, you know, coming from uh, Ostia, Croatia, this is a very small town and in the middle of war time, it was like like a miracle just to go out of the country and not even going to US or I don't know, UK or Asia. And I saw this BMX as perfect opportunity to meet new people, to enjoy sports, to travel around. And I didn't see it like a sport and competition. I just saw it as a, as an opportunity in life. And I, I really enjoyed that time. It was a great time. That's, that's from war to a Red Bull athlete. That is one hell of a story. Let me, let me step back. Cause I, I I've got to ask this. I was not born into war. Um, like you were, uh, did I go to a war? Yes. But what did that experience sort of, how did that mold you? into the person you are today? I mean, do you look at obstacles today and, and sort of just say that that that's nothing compared to, to what we faced back during the, uh, you know, the, the Serbian conflict? Yeah, I was a kid at that time and I still remember those sounds of explosions and that's really something super scary. And when we enter in COVID and when everybody was too upset, I just remember that and people start comparing this with war but this is not even comparable to be hundred percent honest. This is like COVID is not even 5% of 10% of what war is. And, you know, my father was in war like for five years and I was, uh, we escaped uh, with mother and sister. We escaped with grandpa. We escaped to the sea coast after two years of the war. It was very scary, but you know, uh, we lived, we lived that and then, and it was kind of normal situation, which is crazy. And when I see now these things in Ukraine, it just reminds me of these crazy things. And war yeah. is definitely the worst thing yeah. that can happen. And after this, you just become stronger. And there is no such crazy situation in your life like a war, really. There is no such situation. And But I was a kid, so I don't remember it as a something, you know. For me, it was, it was normal, which is really crazy. You know, people <laughs> played football. Yeah. When that's your normal... It, yeah, I remember like people playing football in the middle of war, going to work, uh, and you you play around, and you just see uh, you just hear the super loud siren uh, uh, warming you to go in basement. Then we just went to the basement. We've been there for a few hours. We are going out. It was crazy. It took like five years, a uh, situation like that, and it became kind of normal, which is completely crazy. Well, you know, first uh, a few things. One, hard times make hard men. Um, and I do remember there, there's an author named Sebastian Younger who went back and interviewed people from the, uh, the Serbian Bosnian conflict. And what he found is those people that had to endure hardship, you know, one, like only one part of the town would have some electricity and then they would black out and other people and they were sharing resources. A lot of the people he interviewed 10 years after the war said at our very worst, 
we were at our very best and we were more unified as a people, uh, helping one another. So th that's, that's interesting in the, whoever made the, uh, drew the, the, the analogy of COVID to war, that, that was probably Americans who lack a lot of perspective. So uh, on behalf of America, I do apologize for that, uh, that analogy. Yeah, that's not even comparable, you know, in, in the COVID, you still yeah. had so many choices and it was like tough and we will speak about that one, but uh, it's not even comparable with the war. This is completely different. Uh, no, it's, it's not someone who's going to make that statement just lacks uh, perspective and usually probably hasn't been to, uh, to, to war. Um, let me, dude, so when you become a Red Bull athlete, does that just change everything for uh, extreme uh, professionals? Yes. So for me, um, at, at this competition that my friends used to organize in Croatia, I saw first, first time I saw Red Bull athlete doing backflip. And I met a guy and he's one of, he was one of the best riders at that time. And when I was speaking with him as a kid at that time, I realized one big thing, and this is something that changed my mind completely since then, that he's also, you know, a man of blood and skin. We have the same skin. We have the same way of thinking. We are humans, like made from the same material. And then I was asking myself, if this guy can be like a world best athlete, why I cannot be there? You know, because we are from the same material. Because before that, I thought like these are like special human or something like that. And this completely changed my mind because we need to sleep. We need to eat. We, we have the same habits. And when you realize that in your head, then you just realize that everything, you can do everything basically. And since then I jump in Red Bull, I got this Red Bull helmet, which is great achievement. And Red Bull is one of the probably best companies uh, by treating athletes worldwide. And I started to travel and, you know, I was kind of living a dream. You go around the world, they pay all your trips. You just ride and enjoy it. That was just like a, I don't know, like a dream. It's amazing how a, uh, energy drink company is now more known for its video and extreme content than, uh, than the actual drink. Um, and, and what I love about your story is, so you eventually went from being a Red Bull athlete to running a, a good portion of their sports marketing. Um, and so you jumped into the business side of things. I'm sure that's not a normal path for a lot of the Red Bull athletes. Um, were you asked to do that or was that your next sort of mission in life? You wanted to learn that skill. Yeah, I was at that time in U.S. training in Woodward Camp, which is an amazing camp. And I heard that my uh, sports manager in Red Bull, he left. And I was thinking, OK, what should we do now? We don't have manager anymore. How are we going to handle all these agreements and everything? I was 20 at that time. And then general manager from Red Bull called me, hey, would you like to jump on his uh, position? I was like, okay, I'm 20 years old. Uh, I know I have no clue about, you know, some leadership stuff uh, and that management stuff. I used to organize some events and helping my guys about events. And I was thinking a little bit and then I realized, okay, on the left side, I have this great dream and I'm already like seven years in this dream and there are injuries, like very serious injuries. On the right side, I have something yeah. new and I will still travel. I will still meet new people. I will still do what I like to do, what I love to do. And then I said, yeah, let's do it. I, I mean, I'm jumping in this seat. And the funny thing was, I was sp speaking a few days ago with my friends about this. I got a job, you know, they told me, look, you need to be there from June 1st. We agreed on salary and everything. I, I, I quit my BMX career. I quit sponsorships. I quit everything. I started working in the first week or second week. They told me, look, this is trial period, three months. And we will see if you got the job, really. I was like, what? I just quit everything. I quit my career. You know, I, I was, oh, man, now I need to do it. And then I jumped 200% in this and I start doing everything to, you know, deliver the business plan and everything. And then finally, after three months, guy from Austria told me, you got a job. <laughs> that was crazy. So, <laughs> in, in, so you're learning the job, really on the job. So you're, you're, you're having to keep play catch up. And then if that's not enough, you in traveling around the world and setting up large events, you say, Hey, I'm going to go get my MBA as well. Yeah. Because, you know, it's very competitive <clears throat> and progressive company, many successful young people and finishing MBA is just normal thing. And we were, most of us were doing that. And I was also, you know, learning two hours, studying two hours before the job, going job 12 hours. And then 
maybe having a reading boot book after that job as well. So it was crazy, five years of crazy times, but that's Red Bull style. And we all did like that. And it was crazy. I always say one of the best schools I ever had, uh, it was uh, working for Red Bull and super competitive, super competitive. You know, you, you work probably every weekend. So I did one year, I did 40 weekends instead of like being at home and chilling. It's really, really mm -hmm. dynamic. Yeah, the uh, the best education is often in the arena. Uh, yeah, I got my MBA at the University of Texas, which which I, I say you're, you're stuttering studying from the stands for uh, for two years. But Yuri, uh, you know, again, I can only imagine the pace uh, working at Red Bull is like uh, basically the analogy would be running around with your your hair on fire, which maybe why why we're both uh, bald from our last <laughs> professions. Uh, you you eventually just and there's a common term called executive burnout at one point you just you hit a wall you burn out what when did you know you were sort of at your your max yes it uh, after five years of doing that i saw this is too crazy pace and you travel all the time you work 12 plus hours per day you drink three five red bulls per day you drink a vodka red <laughs> bull at the weekends uh, to, because you have after parties and you cannot miss that you know and it's party hard, very hard motor in the company. And I, I was uh, like feeling bad. I, I had like some symptoms on my body as well. Uh, and I just realized that, oh my God, this is uh, too fast, too crazy. And I'm not sure if uh, I can uh, last uh, long if I'm doing uh, like this. And then I was start thinking about how I can change that. And But I still wanted to do what I love to do, like traveling, meeting new people, having some challenges. And then I decided, okay, it's enough. Uh, it's enough and we cannot uh, continue like this. I need to change something. And I knew that going in uh, entrepreneurship will be even crazier, but I knew that I will be two or three or five years in the fire, but then it will be, it will become uh, easier. And yeah, that was a decision. Let's leave the company and let's start something new. And this is when Highlander was born as well. And so you stepped out of one thing, which seems a little crazy because you stepped out of a high pace and everyone knows a startup is, I mean, you, you, like you said earlier, you're invested 200% into that. And it's, I mean, startups, what most, most startups don't last past three years. So you guys start in 2017, you and a friend, and you start this sort of long distance hiking event uh, series. Um, and you start to get some traction over the next two years. And then COVID hits. Yeah, so just to go a few steps be, uh, before, friend of mine and the guys that I did, uh, that I started Highlander with, they were also in event industry. And we were already tired of this, like having huge events, TV broadcast, you know, going live to three or five TV televisions, it's really crazy thing. And big sponsorships, 100,000 people at the events, crisis communication, all these things. And we just, uh, you know, wanted to do something more relaxed. And this is how Highlander was born because we wanted to combine our passion with uh, still with business, what we are doing, because we chosen that business. Uh, and we started Highlander for fun, you know, actually for, for our friends. We said, okay, let's organize an outdoor festival where we will hike, where we will have endurance, like 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, but super relaxed, no competing. We go there, we turn mobiles off. Uh, we, we share, you know, experiences with other people. We make fire together. We, we enjoy the nature. This was very important. And we started it for fun, but it was not jumping straight from fire to fire because, uh, you know, after Red Bull, I went out and started doing consulting, which was much easier. You know, big companies yeah. which are doing yeah. events, they call us, Hey, can you set up a crisis plan for us? For me, that was easy. You set up a crisis plan and you, and you earn, I know, 50 K. Uh, so it was easy, 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 easy part. But then, okay, we started Highlander and, you know, every project which is coming from fun somehow got, uh, get tr traction. And yeah, in 2019, we, we realized, oh my God, this can be possible in every country. And, uh, let's bring this, it's super positive energy. Let's bring this to all people, uh, in the world. And then COVID hit in the middle of a uh, growth plan. T tell me about the first one you guys held because it was 2017 in Croatia. 
It was the, you said something like 70 of the 70 percent of the people couldn't finish. Uh, it rained the whole time, 30 percent finished. But you, but I remember reading the article that said for the 30 percent that finished, they were happy. They were crying. They were drinking together and they, they had this sense of camaraderie. That must have been a, a, an emotional roller coaster, wondering if this thing was going to succeed or not. What, what was that first uh, competition like? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you organize events, uh, you realize, is this event um, good? You realize at finish line, when, when you see people's faces. And we were excited to see how these people will look like after five days of, it was flood, one of the biggest flood in Croatia in the last 70 years. Five days of raining, five nights of raining. And we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, you know, realize what will happen. And, uh, 30% of guys came to finish line and they were like super exhausted. Really. We thought, Oh my God, somebody will kill us because of this. They paid to be crazy exhausted, but they were happy, uh, not jumping around, but, you know, smiling and, uh, say, telling experience. And we said, Oh, that's great. Uh, they, they, they feel what we feel. So we have something yeah. very cool and then let's do it uh, again next year. And without any marketing, uh, without any special investment, we got double number of people next year. I remember we had okay. the IT guys coming uh, there. Ne they never hiked. One of the guys, he, they quit on 50 kilometer. And that guy was like really mentally destroyed for next two weeks. <laughs> but they came year, year after and they finished 100 and they are coming uh, nearly every year. So it, it's kind of like crazy challenge. It's uh, endurance, but it's really about your mental toughness, about uh, how you handle uh, like things in primitive way, cooking, uh, sleeping, um, toilet, um, uh, washing. It's really, it's really adventure. And this is something why people are coming back. This is why we see much more people and why why we see uh, that the event is growing because it's really something special. So I've, I've heard you describe this before and, and uh, loved how you described it on one of the interviews I watched. You talked about how people are just competing every day between the incessant emails and text messages in, in news streams and technology. The way you guys design this without competition and more that, that camaraderie and, and yes, well, well, you can do it as, as pairs and, and it is a very much an individual challenge physically and mentally. It's almost like you guys have designed a, a reset for people only if they do it once a year, it's a way to physically, mentally, and spiritually reset yourself because I mean, you understand what a lot of people don't understand. There's nothing. Uh, nature is as close to God, in my opinion, as you can get, man, like you guys have created a, a spiritual uh, event. I mean, how has that resonated with, with, with people. I mean, are, are tears at the end of this usually uh, one of the most common things you, you see? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we used to organize uh, like Ironman races, different running uh, challenges, cycling races. We, also, we used to organize professional stuff. And when we created Highlander, first of all, we created for ourselves and our friends and not professional athletes. So we wanted, uh, let's say, normal people to join this challenge because we are also not, I'm not climbing. Yeah, I'm not everyday warriors. I'm not climbing Everest or yeah. some peaks. I'm not that kind of guy. I was just guy who got burnout in the in the corporation. So we wanted to organize this. Well, for, let's step back there. You were doing backflips on a BMX. So yeah, I put you in the same category <laughs> as uh, as extreme athletes climbing uh, Everest. But that, I think that's your, your humility coming through. Sorry, Thank I cut you, you for off. This. Yeah, so we wanted to organize it uh, for normal people, from people in business, for people uh, at home, for people uh, doing different uh, things like firefighters uh, and for IT people. So, yeah, and this is um, this was the main idea. We don't, you don't need to be professional. You don't need to have a 15,000 euro bike. You don't need to have some crazy equipment. What, what you need is will to go there and to experience that and to come back on, uh, on, uh, on the point of Highlander so what we realized is that if you go in nature just for a few days, but really like three, five day, three to five days, you start changing yourself. You feel that after two days, three days uh, already, you feel that. And if you're every day in the office, sitting in the car, sitting in the nice apartment, you, you, this is what Joe said, you became uh, too soft. 
And this is really true. This is what's happening to people. Just going out, as you said, you are close to God. You get all these crazy emotions that you forgot. And this was one of the best things that happened to me at Highlander, that I, I wake up uh, emotions when I was a kid. When you were like running around your building, being dirt the whole day, being super exhausted by end of the day, fall asleep in two seconds, you cannot get this in office. Even you like have super big, uh, successful uh, like uh, business done, or you achieved like yeah. millions of stuff like that, you cannot get that feeling. That feeling when you were like super happy when you were a kid, you cannot get it. Yeah, every every adult needs to 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 feel like a kid at some point. Um, what, what what are some of the responses you've got from, you know, those everyday uh, people that decide to sign up for this? And at the very end, I mean, they, they must come to you and just, I mean, bless you. Thank you for, for, for what you've set up. What, what, what are some of those responses? Yeah, it's what's, what is crazy to see. I mean, we did many events and we did many, we had many feedback from people, but I never seen that somebody is doing one page copy uh, on the Instagram post. I never seen that people are, you know, one guy made a Highlander tattoo. Uh, I never seen that uh, people are sending us uh, photos with their kids. Uh, they, uh, Highlander changed their life. Uh, the feedback is so strong that it's uh, one of the best motivation for us to keep going forward. Because, you know, we, we came out from a crazy business and we never thought finishing again in crazy business. And one of the things what motivates us uh, to move forward and to do like this globally is uh, this great feedback from people. I mean, we have so, so much uh, great feedback that it's, we, we will start now doing the list of the best ones, but there are many, many, many things. And okay, when somebody tell you it was great experience, we like event. Okay, this is, let's say, normal feedback if you do your job good, if you do events. But if somebody yeah. says, yep. this changed my life, my kids change uh, her perspective. Uh, it helped my kid and uh, she's sick. Uh, this is something what like triggers different emotions in, uh, in your mind and you want to do it. You want to do it more because you want to hear more feedback like that from the people. And we have really, really so much great feedback that this is the biggest fuel for us to move forward. Really. It, correct me. Are, are cell phones allowed on the course or are those people are not allowed to bring cell phones? Yes, yeah, cell phones are allowed, and if you want, you can have your GPX uh, and map on your cell phone. But uh, you know, you need yeah. to have com compass, and I, I suggest you have compass and your watch, just that you can follow the route. But yeah, one of the best thing is that your phone is there is no signal. This is the most important. No signal. If you wanna, and your hand, you know, is going. Yeah, you want to. Yeah, you want to check your Instagram. You want to check your LinkedIn, your emails. Nothing is there because your your signal is uh, your phone is off. I could I could see people going through withdrawals. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. As as that's happening, and, and God knows I I've, I've been that guy at times. Um, well, I remember we we were at the base of Ama Dablam in Nepal, and we walked uh, probably an hour and a half to get a signal, and it was freezing, and guys were sitting there for one hour on their phones catching up with emails and stuff like that. So. Um, no, I love this, uh, this concept, um, for, for those that are listening that may think, oh, wow, you know, 60 kilometers or a hundred kilometers, you know, I've never done anything like that. Do you guys, do you guys have suggested like, you know, one month preparatory workouts or, or, or do you guys put out any guidance on how to best prepare for, for people that are, are very new to this type of sport? Yeah, so we have 60 miles is the longest one in five days, then 30 miles in three days, and we have 15 miles. So you can choose whatever you want. And we, of course, we suggest people preparation six to three, three months or six months before the event, uh, what kind of diet or what kind of equipment they need, how to prepare. Uh, actually, you don't need some like crazy preparation like for Ironman. It's much, much easier. Yeah. But still, you need to prepare yourself because... Uh, 60 mm -hmm. miles is not a small uh, portion of the of the mountain. So you need to prepare yourself, but you need to try a little bit sleep in the tent, maybe in your garden. You need to cook your food. You need to go a little bit in rain to see how, how it is like being in the rain the whole day. You can have a great time, but you can also have a very tough time, like the guy's first year in Croatia. <laughs> 
Imagine yeah. five days and five nights of strong rain. That was that never happened again on Highlander. Yeah, once once you're wet, it's a whole different uh, experience. Um, so you made a very strategic decision post COVID to uh, link up with uh, Joe De- uh, Cena from Spartan Race, and you guys have decided to to combine efforts. Which hell, man, it's amazing what we can do when we're part of a team. Um, bringing some of his business model over to to, to Highlander. What what do you see the future of Highlander to be? Because I know you're in, you've had 100 events, you're in 20 countries. Where, where do you want to take this, man? Yeah, so first of all, you know, when COVID hit, that was probably after war, the second hardest time ever, because we were like exploding. And I had at that time, super successful company, 35 plus events. Um, my dreams are were on the table. And I started, you know, spending money like crazy. And, you know, finally, after all these years, uh, hard work, living a high life. And then COVID hit, man, it was super hard. I lost 85 or 90% of the business. Uh, some people left. Uh, it was a very dramatic situation. I would say very, very dramatic situation. And in that, that summer, a friend of us met Joe DeSena in New York because Joe was eating there with kettlebell um, chain on his neck. He was eating there and got, our friend went to him. Hey, guy, why are you eating breakfast with this chain? I'm Joe DeSena. I'm Spartan. I like to do tough shit and stuff like that. What you are doing, I'm doing events. What you are, Oh, I have friends in Europe who are doing events as well. What kind of events? And friend described him Highlander. And that was a click. Joe said, uh, call the guys. I want to have a partnership with them. And at that time, we were looking for investors to for the growth. And we immediately clicked. When I heard his story about changing life, for him, this is not only business. You know, It's really changing lives and helping people to run over the obstacles every day. I love that story because we have the same vision. And we said, okay, let's go in partnership. And he helped us. And the Spartan company helped us a lot Uh for the, you know, going to US, we have now first event in US and going to other countries. They had like so, they have so much knowledge. They spent so much money in the last 20 years and they learned a lot. So we don't actually need to yeah, have yes. the same mistakes. And yes, this is how the partnership was born, basically in the middle of COVID, in the middle of COVID. Yeah, I mean, with, with his experience doing that and then your experience, you know, running uh, events for Red Bull, that, that's a lethal combination that that's a beautiful uh a marriage so to speak of, of two entities coming together uh where, where, what do you have planned for 2023 how are you going to expand uh highlander so um, we always wanted to come in us because we had many requests from people uh, in us in the last few years and you know what i like about us you guys are i would say super brave when you see like how you do business how you do sports how you do like, uh, I met people who wake up at 4 a.m. Uh, and stuff like that. You don't see that much in Europe, to be honest. And I always believe like U.S. is uh, if you want to go like 200 percent or 300 miles per hour, that's U.S. And we came here. We want to expand here. We want to have five, even seven Highlanders next year in U.S. I see that like, community is amazing. People are really into the details and they love uh, adventures. And I'm super excited to see uh, U.S. guys uh, next week at the, at the event. And it will, be, it will be super cool. So U.S. is one thing. And then we go on other locations. Uh, we have, as you said, 20 plus countries. And we want to expand in some other locations uh, in Europe, in Middle East, Asia, uh, Australia. But, you know, the, the goal is to also to have the biggest hiking club in the world called Highlander Club and that we connect people from different uh, you know parts of the world and so they can speak with each other they can travel to each other they can jo- go for highland because we have many solo hikers they meet some of them yeah. are going single yeah. and finishing in a, in a couple <laughs> in highlander event so we want to work a lot around the community we want to share equipment because one of the biggest uh, let's say, um, challenges is to get equipment. Uh, Because some people Mm -hmm. don't want to spend 3,000 or 2,000 for equipment. Okay, some people have two backpacks. They can give it to you. They can share. So we want to make a platform for community that will really boost the whole thing and that we can have this Highlander feeling uh, all around the globe. This is our goal. And for next year, we have big plans. 
challenging plans, but you know, we don't want to finish in this burnout area. <laughs> we learned yeah, that yeah, story. Yeah. Well, you look, you look at uh, business models like, uh, and actually we, we wrote about Joe, uh, Tessina in, in a book we have coming out, uh, for what he created with that community aspect of, uh, Spartan pure genius. Once you have a community, once you build that community, the, the business model will, will speak for itself. So good on him and good on you, man. We, uh, we end this podcast with, with a few questions where, where, where we ask you to get vulnerable and maybe, maybe our listeners can take one or three nuggets away to implement into their lives. And then lastly, I, I want to direct people, uh, of where they can find you and where they can get involved. But first question is what's the hardest decision you've ever had to make in your life? To leave, uh, to leave a great company, safe job, amazing job, amazing bonus, Formula One weekends and stuff like that. And to go from zero, <laughs> this was probably the hardest decision ever. The hardest decision. But you did it for your health. Yeah, for my health. And it was too, too, too fast pace. And, you know, I wanted to go for some change. And I believe if you want to have some change in your life, you need to go when you are on the top. You don't make changes in your life when you feel bad because probably it will be a bad decision at that time i was like really doing top but feeling burnout and then it was right time to yeah. to make decision but it was very hard for me you know i yeah. came for like very small town you know to get a job in red bull that was like going top of the world and to leave that job and you know all these benefits you have or everything that was really hard that was really hard probably the yeah the probably the the toughest decision I, I have no doubt you, you felt like you're part of a family within that, uh, within that company, especially with what you guys do. Um, biggest regret of your life, maybe that opportunity you wish you had seized, maybe a relationship you, you wish you had, uh, you know, mended. Um, what, what, what's your biggest regret? Yeah, going in, in entrepreneurship. No, it's a joke. <laughs> no, my biggest uh, regret is I lost, uh, I lost some people in this process. You know, uh, when I, because I never led, led company before and I started the company, you know, from zero and in this process and in this hard process of COVID, uh, I lost some people and this is my biggest regret because they were nice people. We had a uh, amazing times and it's a process. People go in and go out, but I, I wish if, if they stayed with us, uh, this is very hard for me because you, you develop relationship. And for me, I yeah. would say this is the hardest part. You know, I know for a lot of business owners, they say the same thing. And it's amazing startups, one, who you start with is not who you end up with. And, and that's just that environment is, is hard for some people to operate in. And, you know, and sometimes you got to let people go, even though you have the best of intent as a business owner. Some, sometimes things just don't work out according to plan and, and you've got to cut headcount and, and that sucks. So I'm with you there. Um, what are, what are Yuri's, one to three tenants by which you've lived your life that have led to the overwhelming majority of your su success. And when I say tenants, it could be like discipline, hard work. What do you hold dear sort of as, as your code? Yeah, I work hard. I like to work hard. And I think like uh, working hard beats every talent and it's kind of purpose uh, in your life to do something what you love to do and to do something for other people. Second is I would say I never bid. So I always go for some uh, good model for you and me. If you are if you are doing business, I don't like to bid, and this is something what saved uh, me in the end uh, in COVID, because uh, I still had some good deals because uh, I was always fair with my partners, and I'm always looking for value for you and me. And what I would say also is discipline is super important. Uh, if you have a plan, you need to have a like good plan, but you need to have discipline to pull off this plan and yeah, I think, uh, and focus on what you want. Many people, many, many people focus on, uh, something what they don't want thinking about stuff, uh, they want to avoid or stuff like that. No, just focus on what you want. This is for me, one of the main, um, my, one of the main, uh, how to say inputs, you need to focus on uh, stuff that you want to achieve. Those, th those, those are awesome, man. Um, lastly, and, and I think this one is especially well suited for you because you made a major career shift because you were assessing, you know, what, what's truly important in life. I always ask this of all my guests when, when your time comes 
and for you, you know, hopefully that's 40, 50 years down the line. When your moment comes, how are you going to look back on your life and evaluate whether you've lived a good life? What's most important to you at that final, final moment? So first will be that uh, I don't uh, regret too much, uh, especially I don't want to say one day, oof, I could do that, uh, but I was lazy. I, I, I was uh, like too soft or something like that. I want really to take all these opportunities in my life because if you're healthy, if you can make your decisions in the morning, uh, the only the sky is limit. That's really like that. A second thing, what is very important for me and family and friends is a benchmark that you are setting up. You know, my parents, for them, the most important was that the, the son finished the college. That was the benchmark. And now I want to push the benchmark uh, far more that my kids say, okay, father was doing a World Series in hiking and the first mountain is 600 kilometers from uh, my town. Hmm, what should we do, you know, to set up the benchmark? I think this is very important uh, for kids, you know, to to learn more languages, to fly around, to do not one business, five businesses, 10 businesses, to finish 10 Highlanders per year. I think a benchmark is a very important thing in the life. Uh, same as, uh, as I said, like people in U.S. set up the benchmark in business, really. And uh, this is why they are the best companies in the world. Same like uh, other countries. Uh, I think it's very important to have benchmark and to push the benchmark much more. This is something what I can call it also legacy. Benchmark is also a kind of yeah. legacy. This is very yep. important for me. And when I see my team, Highlander team, what we are doing now, I mean, uh, it's a huge benchmark for our kids, uh, for our friends, uh, for other companies in Croatia. This is, this is something very important for me. Man, we, we talk about something I call the legacy of leadership. And it's, it's exactly that. And one of the things, too, is, you know, another sign of success is if people leave Highlander and then they go up, they go off and set up these other companies and in different spaces that are highly successful. I mean, it's a, it's a testament to your leadership and how you developed them. But I, I do want to go back to your first point, And this is the thing is the, the worst thing is a life unlived. And, you know, there, there's a, there's the poem from uh, Tecumseh. It's called Tecumseh's uh, poem. And where he says, you know, when your time comes to die, be like, be, be not like those who's, who fear the uh, fear of death and basically weep for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way is, is living life to the fullest, whatever that may mean for you. Because when that time comes, you are going to regret uh, if you did not uh, live life to, to the fullest. Yuri, uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to find a way to make it to one of these events um, and see it for myself and live it uh, for myself and I'll always take a reset. But for the listeners, what are the best ways? Where can they find you? Where can they get signed up for one of these events? Especially, you know, most of our markets in the U.S., if you're holding more of these in the U.S., where can they find that information? Perfect. Uh, so www.highlanderadventure.com. This is our web. And we are on Instagram as well, Highlander Adventure, and on Facebook. Very approachable. Uh, we are happy to have much more people at our events. And we invite all I'm super happy to meet you as well in person. And let's go for Highlander event together uh, next year in U.S. because uh, this is the last one uh, next week here. And yes, uh, everybody is welcome. And uh, please join us and start some changes in your life. Start some changes and you will feel, I, I guarantee you will feel much better. And thank you, Mike, yeah, taking uh, for that this leap great is the podcast. Hardest part, man. And yeah, taking so that much. leap for our audience is the hardest part, but this would be a major reset. Yuri, congrats on all the success. Your story is amazing, man. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us and, and teach us a thing or two on how to live a, uh, a life well-lived. Uh, for all of you, thank you for joining us. Again, this is the Men's Journal podcast or the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sorelli. We'll see you next time.